Hello everyone, this is Tekken at Tech. In this podcast, we discuss technology that powers education and improves learning for all. Welcome to today's episode. I'm your host Rishi from Magic at Tech and our guest for today's podcast is Josh Jarrett, SVP of Strategy at Wiley. Josh is an experienced innovator and executor at intersection of higher education and employment. He has built products, programs, and relationships that have helped hundreds and thousands of people successfully earn degrees and secure meaningful work. Josh, thanks for joining me and welcome to today's show. Thanks for having me, Rishi. I'm really glad to be here. Josh, why don't we start with having some background about how you got into education and your journey since then? Sure. I, uh, I actually started my career in management consulting and product management during the original dot-com bubble back in the late 90s, uh, early 2000s, and, uh, and really switched my career into nonprofit consulting and used that to talk my way into the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation in 2006. And the charge there was, how do we reduce inequity in the U.S. in the most cost-effective way possible? And so I was part of the team that launched our post-secondary success strategy, focusing on helping more low-income students, students of color, get access to and succeed in uh, and earn a credential with labor market value beyond high school. And so I led the innovation and technology portfolio there for seven years, and then subsequently have worked in a number of uh, organizations at that intersection between education and employment. I co-founded a venture-backed startup. I uh, spun a education benefit company out of Arizona State University. I worked at a university in Australia on their short course uh, programs, online programs. I, I created a nonprofit during COVID to help COVID impacted workers get short term reskilling and in demand careers. And then two years ago, I joined Wiley uh, to lead, their, uh, lead our strategy which means looking at the future strategy of the organization, threats and opportunities, our M&A strategy, and I've built an internal innovation team uh, as well during that time. Wow, that's that's truly interesting. You know, I see your entire remit has been higher education and you have been very instrumental and pivotal toward, uh, you know, this domain. Yeah, most of the work has been in higher education and really the intersection between uh, higher education and the workforce. So it's really about how we help people fulfill their their uh, their own individual potential and how we help them launch successful careers and how society gets the most out of uh, all of the potential that we have distributed across our uh, our, our population. Interesting. So Josh, uh, as you know that uh, artificial intelligence has been pivotal and its promises are big with respect to, you know, the higher education, including personalized learning, improved student support and more efficient grading and data analysis. So however, like any technology, AI is not a panacea. And right now there's a lot of uncertainty surrounding its use in education. Can you give us your perspective on this? Sure. So, so both personally and at Wiley, we are absolutely supporters of the responsible use of AI in education. Uh, we think it's going to unlock some real benefits to learners and to organizations. Uh, but we also recognize that there's some, some serious threats that that brings. So we've got to be thoughtful. Um, we've got to be smart about how we, how we use humans to set guardrails and to uh, uh, do quality control. But I think we've got some real analogies to build off of. If you think of the calculator, if you think of the internet, if you think of Wikipedia, um, each of those has been a new shock to the system, a new technology. Uh, we, we got very uh, initially alarmed. What is this going to mean? And we worked our way through it and we got to an equilibrium point. And I think the same thing is going to be true here. There's so much buzz about chat GPT and generative AI. But one way to think of that is a really, really, really good Wikipedia. Um, and so I think if you think of some of the history that we have, we've got tools that we can use to manage through this. Does that mean that, you know, AI potentially could help our education systems, which are inching toward holy grail of building a student base, particularly in the workforce readiness market? So I, I do think there's a lot of opportunity. And, and to be clear, I think there's two big opportunities that uh, AI can help us in that holy grail of, of getting students workforce ready to succeed. There's a big piece around learning and there's a big piece around talent discovery. Um, so on learning, uh, uh, Benjamin Bloom of, of Bloom's Taxonomy did uh, research in the 80s called the Two Sigma Problem. We have known since the 80s 
how to improve student learning by two sigma or two standard deviations? Mm -hmm. The answer is an individual tutor and mastery based learning. The problem is we've never been able to afford giving every learner a personal tutor. So it's not actually a, a, a limit of our knowledge of what works. It's our inability to afford it. And so the potential of AI to create truly personalized learning experiences where you can ask a generative AI engine to say, explain this, this complex chemistry concept to me like you're my older cousin um, you know, who, you know, who has this background and that background, right? And, and you can get a, a, uh, a structured tutored experience back around, well, here's the concept. Here's why I chose that. Ask me a question. I'll explain it. And so I think we have to harness that. Um, but there's a real opportunity to create much more personalized learning. And then on the set, on the other side is of talent discovery. You know, this, the, the big patterns allow us to connect potential with opportunity. So one of the startups that I helped co-found that I mentioned was called Koru. We built predictive hiring engines for companies to do early career talent hiring. So they, we would look at uh, soft skills assessment plus signals in someone's background and could predict with 20 to 50% more accuracy if someone was going to be a successful hire than the interviewers themselves. Uh, and so I think that we're going to be able to connect more people to better opportunities uh, through some of these AI engines as well. I, I totally agree, you know, into this whole lifelong learning Practically, you know, AI, AI is definitely instrumental. And, and in fact, to the audience today who will be listening to this podcast, I think more are aspirational workforce who are definitely seeing it both as a threat and an opportunity. And, and you know, all your insights are definitely going to be meaningful to them. So moving on to my next question, when Chad GPT was released, there was a lot of uproar from every sector, especially with its ban due to plagiarism. But you can't stop advancement in the technology just find ways to harness them. In what ways do you see education doing this? What's getting easier? Yeah, I think that um, I think that we do have to embrace the technology with smart guardrails. And I think those guardrails are really important, and those guardrails are going to vary depending on the stakes of the moment and uh, you know in the, in the, the specific context. But generally speaking, technology that makes the human condition easier, will almost always win. If this makes someone's life easier, they can get something done faster with less effort. Uh, you know, water runs downhill. Don't bet against water running downhill. And, and I think this is one of those moments where, um, where the, the, uh, you know, the water, the dam is broke, the water's running downhill. We've got, we can redirect it, we can steer it, um, but it's gonna keep, keep, uh, keep running downhill. So I think there's some real specific opportunities with AI, and in particular, I'm thinking about generative AI right now. Uh, I think there's three. One, the creation of educational content gets much easier, faster, and cheaper. Uh, we're doing experiments at Wiley right now uh, in creating assessment questions, uh, at cre creating supporting videos very quickly to support text and uh, other, other materials. Um, so I think you can create a wider range of content, uh, so it reaches a, a wider range of audiences and at lower cost. So content creation is certainly one of those. Uh, the second is creating more personalized learning experiences like I talked about uh, with these kind of intelligent agents or personalized tutors that can really help people solve that two sigma problem I mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. And then the third is a really big one, which is much of education is currently and even more so in the future, going to be about motivation, the motivation to learn. So how can we use some of these tools to do that? Uh, think of this way. I'm, I'm sort of struggling. I'm burned out. I'm tired. It's late at night. I'm studying. And you know, here's a button that says, create a picture of me in a job that uses this content, this thing I'm studying right now. And then suddenly there's an image, literally it's me doing a job in the future that I'm happy and I'm liking and I'm using my engineering um, geometry in an engineering application, building, a, building a, a bridge. And that's interesting. And that motivates me and it puts me back to work. Um, so I think that's uh, an example outside of just the learning moment where there's ways that we can help students connect opportunities that will excite them. Yes. So... If you can uh, also talk about certain risks as, as uh, you, you might have a better view from a content provider perspective, where do you see, you know, the industry going and, and taking those perspectives? 
Absolutely. So there, there are cert, uh, there's three risks that I would call out. One, shortcuts in the learning process. You know, it's just we we as humans look for ways to get the amount of work done with uh, you know the shortest time possible. But there's also a saying that it's the work that does the learning. And so if I'm looking for a you know a shortcut, um, am I am I uh, you know actually shortcutting the, the learning? But for example, if I'm about to do a, if I do a, a, a long paper on uh, the Weimar Republic and how that, uh, uh, you know, led to conflict in Europe, I might go to ChatGPT and say, can you generate an outline for me on this topic? Mm-hmm. And that might help me create an outline and that might allow me to get started working on that paper. Is that cheating or is that just me kind of, you know, helping make my life a little bit easier, getting started? Um, we're going to have to figure out where the, the, the rule, is, the line is there. But certainly those shortcuts might shortcut my learning. Then there is outright cheating and plagiarism. It's going to be that much easier to say, no, go ahead and write me that whole paper on the Weimar Republic. Um, and so we're going to have to be really intentional and thoughtful about that. Um, uh, the third one I might mention is that we risk confusing learners. Uh, th- this technology and, and generative AI in particular is a people pleaser. It mm-hmm. will do whatever it takes to prove whatever point you ask it to prove, even if it's not true. These are called hallucinations. It'll say, here's, here's a justification for the point you want to make, but it may not actually be based on fact or citations or anything like that. And it also carries the biases that, in, that, uh, that were built in to, you know, from that original data. Um, and then I also, the last thing I would just mention is, is educational inequality. To the extent these tools aren't free um, and, uh, and certain people get access to them first, or people are able to, to learn the prompt engineering, right, the way to manipulate these tools to help them, uh, then I think we can also exacerbate in educational inequality. That's, that's uh, so awesome of a view. How do you think, uh, you know, educators uh, will, will see this uh, innovation? Are you thinking that they will be accepting this out or do you foresee that this technology will be seen as user friendly or more complex than its predecessors? So I think higher ed and education educators in general have been relatively slow to adopt new technology. We know there's still some VCRs in some classrooms, um, but I think that we're going to have to embrace it and face it pretty quickly. And we're going to have to set some some guardrails or right? define here's where you should be using these tools and here's where you can't. Um, And I think it's going to change the way that education happens in that it may be the end of graded homework. Mm -hmm. Why have homework when I send you at home and I can't tell what you've done, what the machine has done. So I think we might have less graded homework and, and more and graded formative assessments. And it's going to actually raise the stakes on fewer high stakes assessments. Remember things when we were growing up, like closed book test, mm-hmm. pop quiz, oral reports, oral presentations. Yep. Those are all tools that, that isolate the learner's brain from the machine's brain. And I think we're gonna, you're going to see things going back to creating those types of experiences that help isolate what that learner has actually learned. But then in the formative moments, When you are doing your homework, I think it creates a real opportunity to help create better formative learning experiences. So better formative learning experiences with more controlled, higher stakes uh, uh, summative assessments. That's awesome. And and do you think these these thoughts could also portray on, on bridging in the gaps on equity in learning? I think it's going to, it's as many... I think it will have both a positive and a negative effect on equity and learning. As many of these technologies do, they create opportunity and around access and around personalization and around making up for uh, resource limitations. And they create the opportunity for those with resources and knowledge to run further faster. Um, so for instance, right, think about uh, test prep courses, right? SAT prep courses, Princeton Review and Kaplan and all of those. Uh, right, the the those have allowed uh, certain people with access to take two or three of those classes before they take the SAT and perform better. Um, but now we have digital. You know, we can you can take those classes for free or near free online now, and so more people are able to to access those. 
Um, so the idea that we could we could give every every learner around the world a private personalized tutor is an amazing aspirational possibility. Uh, but the reality is we will get to the solutions that accelerate the haves first mm -hmm. before we complete the promise of helping get this technology uh, into the hands of everybody else to close the gaps. Interesting. And and within within your own role and, uh, and your enterprise, are there any upcoming signs of progress in this field, be it like, you know, some some platform providers, some tool providers that that you find exciting or, or those are catching your eye at the moment? Yeah, I, you know, look, I think the first application of these is actually going to be in content creation for, so Wiley's a publisher, right? We are a trusted curator of knowledge and, uh, and that comes with a very high bar in terms of making sure that people can trust the quality of the content. Um, and 60% of ChatGPT comes from the open internet, mm -hmm. uh, the content from that. So it's pulling in a lot of things that aren't validated, aren't curated, and aren't authenticated. So I think there's a real big opportunity to save time and money in creating high-quality curated content, but it's still mediated by humans. And so we're doing a lot at Wiley right now to, to increase the speed, agility, and, and, and cost efficiency of content creation mm -hmm. that still has the quality bar that you can trust. So that's the first easy application for us. I think the second one is then more around these personalized learning experiences so that we can, we can start to put these tools in the hands of learners and teachers so that they can interact better. Uh, and then the third is this longer term question of creating, creating uh, new ways to access information and content and connect to talent uh, that is that uh, that builds off of these models. Um, for instance, on our on the research side, we do a lot of work at Wiley on research publish academic research publishing. Mm -hmm. We're using uh, AI models to find peer reviewers, to find co-authors, to find experts around the world in your particular area that you might want to write a, a collaborate and write a paper on, or who ought to review your journals. Which is creating a much more diverse set of researchers working together. And so these new networks that get formed are really exciting to us. Interesting. And, and in what ways should businesses and institutions in education prepare so that they are prepared for the adoption and usage of AI? Are you seeing uh, uh, your, your data policies or data governance frameworks being changing? Or, or what kind of guidance do you have for businesses here? So the, the worst thing to do, I think, is to do nothing. Uh, because people are going to start experimenting and, and uh, you know, going to be confused or they're not going to want to do anything because they're not sure. So I think be very clear about approved use. Here's what we encourage you to do. Uh, don't ban it outright, um, but define the approved use and give training on what are the risks. Here's what you need to know. Uh, this content that comes back it has hallucinations in it. It is not necessarily fact-checked and validated. Uh, it'll tell you it's a people pleaser. It'll tell you what you want to hear. Uh, think here's what to do about ethical or moral considerations and what you return here. Here's how this data that you put into these models is going to be used. Um, so don't put our proprietary content into a request on this particular uh, uh, large language model prompt engine because they're actually taking that content and building it back into their models. Different providers don't do that. So mm -hmm. setting up the clear guardrails and um, use cases and protections is really important. Um, I think the second thing is thinking about where are, where are the stakes the highest, right? Where the quality of information must be accurate, where the quality of the assessment must be accurate, right? And try to make sure that you can create um, uh, the type of, of uh, learning moments or assessment moments or what have you that are protected from, uh, from, from some of these risks. Uh, and then the last thing is to think about, hey, use 10 or 20% of your time to look for the disruptive business models. Uh, there could be some real changes to how your customers are going to access information or going to find networks or going to generate content on their own. And that's going to create potential for 
new opportunities, but it could also radically disrupt some business models that are out here now. So it's the thing that you know comes at, at 4 a.m. in the morning when you're sleeping that uh, that that disrupts the, your your whole business model. You got to figure out a way to spend enough time to be looking for those. Great, great, and. In in our show today, you know, we definitely have a lot many ed tech leaders and educators listening. What is what is their responsibility? What what do you think they owe to the society today? Yeah, look, I think in in the history of human knowledge acquisition and learning up to this point in time, we've been standing on the shoulders of giants who are human. But we're at a seminal moment where the next giant on whose shoulders we're going to stand will probably be a machine for the first time ever. We're building our knowledge and our ability on top of a machine's input and knowledge. That's exciting and that's scary at the same time. It's a milestone in the history of humanity. And so we need to really thoroughly explore the pluses and minuses of this new development because it's not going to go away. We can't put the genie back in the bottle, um, but we got to figure out how to do this not just in like, what's the quickest way I can make my ed tech company figure out how to make a buck by saying I've got a new, you know, generative AI application, um, but we've got to figure out how to use it responsibly, morally, and ethically. Uh, And that's going to be something that each individual innovator, entrepreneur, and and ed tech company has got to think about, but it's something we need to think about as a community and as as a group of ed tech innovators because uh, it's it's a lot and it's moving really quickly and we got to put our our uh, best brains on it. Josh, uh, I I would like to thank you for joining me today for the latest Tech in EdTech podcast. We really appreciate your insight and look forward to you and our audience joining us in future podcasts. Have a great day ahead. I believe this was a meaningful session and I'm sure, you know, all of our audience will definitely value from it. Rishi, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. It's uh, exciting, exciting materials and uh, I look forward to uh, listen to more of your podcasts coming up. Thank you. Thank you.